Jonah in chapter 1, I'll be looking at verses 4 through 7. Well, I'll start, get context again. I will start in verse 1. We're just going down to verse 7 here today. It says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But, this is where we're going to start off today, 4 through 7. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares uh, 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 that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, every one to his fellow, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. Lord, we ask your blessing tonight as we come to the book of Jonah. We pray that you'd guide in it, that we see the truth that is here. Lord, that would be a help to us, that it would draw us closer to you. Lord, please... May this book be practical in our life and, and strengthen us. Lord, if there's anyone here who does not know Jesus Christ as Savior, of course, we pray that conviction and that drawing upon their heart, even during this service, that they would, that by the conclusion they would place their faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, please bless and work. We pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> so we began the book of Jonah last week. And again, I am looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a neat study. I, and uh, I think it'll, it's, it's going to take a, a little bit longer than I thought, but that's good. I like it when I'm getting into it and you can see different things. And, you know, I really thought I was going to finish chapter one um, this service, this evening, mixing the introduction with last week's and the first couple of verses, by, that, which really are an introduction to the book, and then finishing off chapter one. But it certainly isn't that way. There's going to be so much here in these few verses. But by way of introduction, we saw that God called Jonah to Nineveh. It was the Assyrian capital, which was the world power of that day. It was a great city. It was, it was the, really, uh, at this time frame, it was considered the greatest city of its empire. So really, of the world at that time, would be Nineveh. Um, it was one of the most beautiful cities in the region. It's close. It was in, in modern-day Iraq. It sat on the Tigris River. There was all these. They had a watering system in place. Uh, um, it was. It was very uh, well laid out. It was very organized. It was very metropolitan. There were people from all over the Assyrian Empire that had lived there, but the Assyrians were known for their wickedness, and this was the capital. They were an incredibly wicked, vile people. Um, even though the city was, was incredible, the wickedness there still would have been tremendous. As I mentioned last week, there's only a couple of times in the Bible where the Lord says about the level of sin in a place coming up before him. Well, one of those places, of course, is the city of Nineveh. So the Lord is preparing to destroy this massive city. Again, this is a city probably somewhere around 500,000. We actually have a population given to us in chapter 4 of how many children are there. And so based upon that, we know it's somewhere around 500,000. There are many who, who speculate that it was as high as a million that would have been in the Assyrian capital. And so nonetheless, it's one of the largest cities of the day. It's a beautiful city, but it's, again, and the walls. One thing that amazed me when I was studying last week, I did not know that till last week, was the walls were so thick around this thing that they could run several chariots on top, side by side by side, on top of the wall. It really is incredible. But again, to Jonah, if you remember, this was everything, they stood for everything against what he believed. They were obviously pagan in culture. Um, they represented everything that Israel hated. His view, of course, he, he, well, I'll get into that more in, in the message today. It was, the wickedness was great. Uh, let me go over some of it again from last week, how brutal they were. They would massacre their enemies, mutilate 
dismember, decapitate, burn people alive. They would skin people alive. They would rip out tongues. They prided themselves on making, um, uh, using human heads to form pyramids, to, almost like decorative pieces with human heads. Really was. You can see the how reprobate they actually were. They would pierce the chin. I mentioned in some of the readings. A lot of this is taken, by the way. See where do you get this information from? From actually leadership within the Assyrian Empire of, that's found on tablets of what they would do and was put in a sense of pride. They prided themselves on how brutal they could be. <clears throat> Again, so they would use fear when they came into an area. It, the Assyrian military was not what you wanted to see coming to town. It was going to be brutal when that took place. And this is going to be the empire, by the way, that the Lord does use to judge the northern kingdom, which is where Jonah is even a prophet. He was, in, he was actually a prophet out of Galilee. Um, he, he lived just a few miles from Nazareth. So this was everything. This was everything that Israel hated. All of a sudden, the Lord calls Jonah to head to Nineveh to preach and let them know that in 40 days, God is going to destroy you. Again, I believe Jonah was actually excited at first because he wanted to see the destruction. But as we're going to see, we get into chapter uh, when we get into chapter four. The reason why Jonah didn't want to go was because he knew how merciful God was, and he was afraid they would repent, and God would not judge them. It's amazing where again where Jonah's mind is. Again, it was only five hundred miles away from when, from the time that God called him, but he decides, of course, to head to Tra to Tarshish which was 2,500 miles away. And again, when he it set, uses the phrase twice, he was going to flee from the presence of the Lord. This is a prophet of God. Jonah's not a stupid man. He understands the omnipresence of God. He has that doctrine down. But as a prophet, it was as if he was standing in the presence of God. He is telling the Lord, I quit. I'm no longer your servant. I'm not standing before your presence. I'm done. And he goes as far away as he can, basically, to Tarsus. He thought, I'm going on a nice little Mediterranean cruise to Spain. And that's what he planned. <clears throat> and last week, one of the focuses of last met, we looked at several different things of it, but primarily trying to figure out if there's a Nineveh in your life, something that God's directing in your life or called you to that you are just against. What is it that you fight in relation to God's will in your life? <clears throat> so now as we come here, God decides to send a storm. Last week we got to the, we got to the point where Jonah, he, he happens to go to Joppa. What do you know? There's a boat there going to Tarshish. What do you know? He happens to have enough money to pay the fare to get on that boat. We talked about that as well as when you decide to run from God, make no, make no mistake about it, Satan will be happy to provide all the transportation you need when you're going the other way. And so he gets on the boat. Last week was where we left off. And so now as we come into today's message, we now see that God sends a storm. And this will be a two-part message. Many times God does send a storm in our life to wake us up. And I'll talk more about this here. This is still by way of introduction. To get us back on track. And we're going to see this storm is filled with grace. It's many times we fail to see that we, we fail to look at the storms in a proper way in our life. I was last last week, I think it was Brother Weldy, somebody had asked me last week, if there's any comparison between the fact of Jonah sleeping in the boat and Jesus sleeping in the boat during a storm. As we have both those, and there's obviously Christ has already made one comparison within the Gospels to him being like Jonah three days and three nights in the belly of the well. So I would be you know, referring to his death, burial, and resurrection. And, and so, sure enough, I got dwelling on that last week, especially today, going over those thoughts. And I think there's somewhat of a connection, but I don't think it's, I think it's not because of similarity. I think it's because of the opposite. Christ knew the storm was present. It was about arresting faith. It was about teaching a lesson on faith. It was about, it, it, the reason why some storms come are all about faith and knowing God is in control, that at any moment he can calm it, that you can rest in the midst of those storms. But that certainly isn't the case of Jonah, and that has nothing to do with why he is asleep in this boat. He doesn't even realize yet that the storm is there. And this storm is not about teaching him a lesson on faith. I talked about last week, I believe Jonah was a man of faith. We see evidence of that, the evidence of, of, of the idea of Nineveh repenting uh, of God's goodness. There, there, was a, a, there was a strong element of faith in the prophet Jonah. This storm was not about a lesson on faith in Jonah. This was, this was about chastisement. 
This was about getting him back on track, which is a whole other reason why God sends storms in our life. <clears throat> so we're going to look at here this evening, we're going to look at three parts I have this broken into, sort of S's here, if you will. God sends a storm. Then we're going to look at the sailor's reaction to it. And then the sleeping prophet. So first, let's look at the storm that God sends. Verses 4 and 5. says, but the Lord, Jonah's in the boat, but the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. Now, according to other Jewish writings, actually, they, they say that the storm started one day into the journey. One day in the journey was when the storm kicked up. I don't know if you've ever been out on the ocean when a storm hits, but that's a scary place to be when you're on the ocean and a storm hits. You know, one of the worst ones I remember in PNG, and it wasn't even that bad of a storm, but it was bad enough that the ocean was just going crazy. We had, you know, Daniel was the only one with me. We're actually preaching on a little, uh, a fairly good sized island called New Hanover. We had to take a boat there, it was several hours out to off the north coast of of New Ireland. So we went there and we were coming back. We spent several days in that island and we had to come out through a river. We got out to the ocean. The ocean was fine. You always check it. I, I learned by this time never to go out on the ocean when it was bad. We had enough crazy things happen that I would just sit and wait, even if it took several days. But we left and everything was great. We started off, we stopped at this little tiny island. It wasn't even inhabited. It's just little thing that had coconuts on it. We stopped on there. And uh, we got some cool out from the coconuts and whatnot. And then we started again. It was just a tiny island. And, and we get back on, on the, it's just a little banana boat. We turn right around this island. And just as we started heading out, the wind kicked up. The wind kicked up. And all of a sudden, the waves and the swells started getting bigger and bigger. And we're still running down. And it just got worse and worse. And then the rain came flying in with it. The clouds rolled in. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, this is not good. And you can just see the operator is no longer, he's no longer going a direction. Now you can see him because it's just a small banana boat. And I've learned enough what they do when they're worried is they do their best to try and ride on top of those swells. So that's all he's doing now. He's just trying to maintain the boat, keep it on top of the swells. We actually took a canvas, like a tarp, and just covered up. I mean, it's pouring rain on us. The wind's going crazy. And there's only about four or five of us in the boat. And the operator has to stand outside of that. And so he's just trying to maneuver around it. But, of course, you learn to pray. You're, and you're just praying there and praying there for this wind to calm down. And it's a scary thing when you're out there and that takes place. Now, what the Bible describes here, of course, is much different than anything I've ever experienced. The Bible says first that, that the Lord sent this great wind and a mighty tempest. Now, just think about that phrase for a second. That had grabbed me just when I was just going through the reading and thinking about it. Was the fact, think, think of what it means in the Bible when God calls something great. When he calls his goodness great. That's a whole lot of goodness. If God describes something as great, it's enormous. It's huge. And he says he sent a great wind. You can just imagine what this would have been like for the mariners. It would have been horrible. It would have, been, it would have produced fear. The storm was sent by God for one reason. Jonah's disobedience. Make no mistake, even though this is a storm, God's grace is throughout it. This is the Lord getting a hold of Jonah. There's many things the Lord could have did to chastise Jonah. I mean, you can think he could have did like he did to Ananias and Sapphira and say, you know what? I'm done with you. You're done. That's it. He could have just took his life. He didn't want to do that. Uh, it's as if, you know, the, the Lord has, I, I think of, where's it? I can't think where it says, it's not Ecclesiastes. Um, where the Lord talks, he, he, uh, he, he remembers that we are but dust. Where am I at? Is that Psalm 103? Anybody remember that? It really is incredible. I'm going to go to Psalm 103. I think that's where that's located, about what the Lord thinks of us in our human nature. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
Yes. Yeah, Psalm 103 is just an amazing song. Look at verse 11. No, verse 10. No, verse 9. <laughs> it just gets better as you go back. Verse 8, we've got to go back to verse 8. It really fits with this, what's happening to Jonah. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. This is true in the life of Jonah. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. It's going to tell us why this is so in Psalm 103. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. That's true. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord, this is getting into the reason why now in verse 13. So the Lord pitieth them that fear him, for he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind patent, it goes on and continues of, of how frail we are. The Lord's remembering that about Jonah. He's dust. He's keeping that in mind right now. So in this storm, there's an enormous measure of grace that is taking place. Because it isn't to inflict pain. God is insane. When, when God chastises, do you understand? It's not God being mad and saying, I am inflicting pain. Now, there's some really poor dads that do that with their children. That think, you disobey, I'm putting you in pain. When the Lord chastises us, when he whips us, the purpose isn't the pain. The purpose is to produce a change. That's why he chastises. That's what he's doing here with Jonah. That, that's what he's putting into his life right now. He's putting this storm in his life. Is it going to produce pain? Yes. Does God's chastisement many times produce pain? Oh, it does. Just like when I spanked my children. But the ultimate purpose wasn't vengeance to get pain. It was to produce a change towards godliness. And so for Jonah here, he's shown in a, by the storm that he is sending, it's all about grace. Jonah will never see Tarshish. Never. That's not going to take place in his life. You want to know why? God had grace on him. God had grace on him. <clears throat> this storm is the Lord Starting now, since the time that he called him to go and Jonah refused, this is now the Lord intervening at this point to get a hold of him. And Jonah's a tough case, as we're going to see as we go through this book. He, even when he has a measure of repentance, it's not with all his heart. <clears throat> so many times the Lord does send a storm in our life to wake us up. To get us back on track. And by the way, it didn't matter how far Jonah was fleeing, God was going to get a hold of him. Didn't matter. And you think about this. This is in a, in a, in a this one sentence here is I was I have several different topical messages from the book of Jonah. I'm not going to do any of those through this through this series. I don't I don't plan on it anyhow. If the Lord directs otherwise, I will. But I remember in one of them that I was studying. One thing that grabbed me was this knowing who Jonah was, being a prophet of God, and what that meant in Israel. What it meant to be a prophet of God. And what Jonah was doing. And remember, last week, thinking about this, when it just clicked. Jonah wrote this. He's writing about himself. Um, what it meant to be a prophet of God, and all that entailed. Jonah, what he was hoping for, if you will, get this, was that God would allow his disobedience. I'm just going to quit, Lord. Just let me go. Just let me go live an obscure life right now. And of course, this is all stemming from a heart that is so... It's amazing how the Lord's... How the Lord is... His sovereignty is incredible. Not only is he concerned about Nineveh, but he decides to use a prophet that needs a change of heart. And he's going to use what needs to take place in Nineveh as well as in the place of one of his own prophets to change his heart as well as to reach the Assyrian capital of the world. <clears throat> so again, in thinking what I, what I brought up in the introduction, we do see two purposes of storms, at least in our life. Some are to teach us faith, of resting in God, of knowing he's in control, that you don't have to fear. 
But then there's other storms. But th- th- those storms never come when you're, when you're running from the will of God. If you're running from the will of God, the storm in your life is not about faith. It's about getting you back on track. That's why it's there. The fact is, a lesson we can take from this is to at what point the Lord chose to reach Jonah, as well as the fish that he's preparing, as well as, uh, as, well as the, the, the wind that's going to be preparing, as well as the, uh, the worm that he's preparing, the gourd that he's preparing, is that God knows you better than you do. He knows exactly what he needs to do to work in your life. <clears throat> God knows how to reach you at the right moment. He let Jonah get this far. Want to know why? He wanted Jonah to face this storm. He wanted Jonah to face, he had things lined up. I assure you, that fish he prepared is right by that boat already. It's right there. God knows what to send in your life to get your attention. Matter of fact, one of the topical sermons I have on this, the first one I ever did on Jonah, is there's a fish coming. That's the title of it, and and really the whole theme of it is is the fact that God will prepare a fish in your life when you're out of his will. Number two, so we see that God sends a storm. Number two we see is is the sailor's reaction, these mariners. Let's look at their reaction. Verse 5. Remember, Jonah's asleep at this time. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. We'll stop right there. Again, these are pagan men. They don't know the true God. They believe simply in false gods. That's all they know. They're not atheistic. They're not agnostic. They simply believe in a lot of false gods. The, they're mariners. They know the ocean. They know the Mediterranean Sea. Matter of fact, it's fair to say that these particular mariners, because of the route they travel, know the Mediterranean perhaps better than any other. They're traveling the entire Mediterranean. They're not just doing a simple coastal route um, that was more common for that day with trading. They're heading all the way to Spain, almost to the Atlantic Ocean. So they would know the sea very well. And they knew that this was not a normal storm. They knew immediately they were in great danger. Now, how I pictured in my mind as I was thinking upon it this morning was like this. Was they woke up after day one. They've been a day at sea. Assuming the other writings of, uh, of that are they're not scripture, of course, but there's other Jewish writings that state the storm took place a day into Jonah's journey. I think they woke up to a beautiful day. And God was going to make sure they knew this was of God. There was nothing from their normal experience that let them believe a storm was on the horizon. I think they woke up to a beautiful day. Sun was out, you know, they're just cruising right along. And then all of a sudden, exactly how the Bible, before the storm hits, what happens first? The wind. A great wind occurs. So you can see everything's going well. Maybe they're sipping their coffee on the deck and all of a sudden... The breeze kicks up. The wind kicks in. It gets stronger and stronger rapidly. You can see them beginning to make adjustments on the boat already as this wind is getting stronger and stronger. Again, as I mentioned, when, when we would travel, and of course, my kid, they're not only Levi's here, he probably doesn't remember too much. When I would go to the West Coast to get on one of the banana boats to go across that strait to get to Kokopo, it wasn't the rain that stopped. It was raining, I'd get on the boat. The rain didn't bother me at all. Clouds in didn't bother me at all. The only time I would, I learned not to get on that boat was when there was wind. If the wind was there, there was no way I was getting on the boat. And so, as a matter of fact, and when we'd be out there and the wind would kick up, what I would always do was, I would, again, I would look at the eyes of the boat operator. And that was sort of I was going for comfort. Because if he looked calm, I knew he experienced this before. But if he looked afraid, we're in trouble. <laughs> he hasn't felt this before. Well, these mariners' eyes, they're afraid. They've never seen anything like this. And you could see with the fierceness, again, this is a great wind that hits. I mean, this is fierce. Out of the blue, it hits them. And you can see them trying to make adjustments. You can imagine the swells that are developing. If God is calling this a great wind, 
Think of how great those, you know what came to my mind? Those images of the Gulf of Alaska and those enormous swells coming up and those boats going up in it and coming back down. Listen, this is the Mediterranean, I understand that, but this is a great wind from the Creator. That's what I think they're experiencing. I think those swells were enormous. I think the pressure that was hitting the boat, they actually believed the boat was going to be broken, the Bible says. So it's a ton and groove boat. This is a ton and groove boat. They believe it's getting ready to split from the forces that are hitting that boat. You can just see the waves that are crashing over. They're panicking. They're just trying to keep the boat afloat. Again, these are experienced mariners, and they know they're in deep trouble. They truly believe they are about to die at sea. Because of how the storm hits and the fierceness of it, what they began to recognize immediately with this storm, that it wasn't natural, that it was supernatural. Even the pagans recognized that. They recognized this was a storm from a God, to put it from their point of view. Because the very first thing they did, even before they lightened the ship, was the shipmaster declared, every one of you pray to whatever God you have. Start praying. They knew the storm was different. It was supernatural. The fierceness of it, the winds, how it hit. I mean, I think if the winds normally in the Mediterranean, I would assume they go east to west or northeast to southwest over there. I really have no idea. That's just an assumption. But whatever it is, I think the winds are even coming from the opposite direction. So they would know this isn't a normal storm. <clears throat> Again, these are pagans. They don't know the true God, but they begin to pray to their false gods. They call out and they call out and they beg for help and they beg their gods for help. But of course, there is nothing. There's no one to hear or answer those prayers. None of those gods are real. They're fake. There's nothing to them. What came to my mind as I was thinking about this, of course, was the prophets of Baal with Elijah on Mount Carmel. The same day that Elijah called the fire down from heaven to consume the offering. But just thinking of those prophets of Baal, they had faith in their false gods, but it didn't matter. I mean, they were literally cutting themselves to show some type of sacrifice to Baal who doesn't exist. But they completely believed that he did. They did. I mean, they actually believed they could call fire down from heaven. But the God was fake. Note these mariners are realizing maybe there is no God. Maybe it's not real, the ones, the God that we're serving. But the first thing they did is interesting. They prayed to their gods. The next step they take, as we read, was they began to throw the cargo overboard. They began to lighten the ship. Their prayers didn't work. So they try, let's say they got to control the ship better. We got a better control of this thing. One of these swells is going to flip us. It's going to break the boat. So they start to lighten the cargo. Keep in mind, when you get in a life, death, and situation, things come into perspective really quick. There's nobody there arguing, wait, we can't, we're not going to get paid when we get to Tarshish. <laughs> it didn't matter. Just throw it overboard. Get everything off here now. They threw it all overboard. Life gets proper perspective really quick when you face death. <clears throat> By the way, the weight that was holding the boat down and causing so much trouble was not the weight of the cargo. It was the weight of Jonah. The Bible talks about the weight of sin. David described it in his life, his sin as a weight that was heavy. Who else does? There's other places, too, that describe it as a weight. Zechariah describes sin as lead, meaning a weight, a heaviness to it. But the only weight that was holding it down, of course, was Jonah. And then also we learn from the mariner's reaction here and what was taking place on the boat, the cost of disobedience. Jonah's disobedience not only led to his own punishment, but it's also those around him, all those who are around him. Our disobedience costs not only our, a, a, a measure of discipline and punishment on ourselves, but those who are around us as well. So they're praying, they're trying to lighten the ship with cargo, but nothing is helping. But then they find Jonah. It brings him to the third point, the sleeping prophet. 
Let's look at the end of verse 5 through 7. <clears throat> but Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. And real quick, I forgot to bring something to my office. Levi, would you run to my office, the billum that's hanging up on the front, on the front case there. Would you bring that to me, please? You'll see it. It's hanging up on, on the... On, when you open the door of the bookcase that you're looking at, it's hanging up right there. <clears throat> so here we have the sleeping prophet. Jonah is asleep down in the middle of this boat. Even though the storm is raging, the Bible says he is fast asleep. Now, I will say this. It's interesting. I think, I think this will be the, one of the crucial parts that helps us practically. I've, I have definitely changed my reason as I meditated upon this on why he was asleep. <clears throat> And, I, and, I, and I, we'll see that, I think, in Scripture here, here today. But many times when you are running from God, you fail to see the storm that is raging all around you. Others can notice it, but you don't. That was the case here with Jonah. Again, Jonah just thought when all this began, I'm not going to Nineveh. He is disobedient to God's call. I am leaving. I'm going to head to this coastal town in Spain that I heard about. It's about as far away as I can get. And of course, as I've already said, he would never make it to Tarsus. So Jonah heads to this remote place in the boat by himself. He's alone. I believe he tried to find this place as soon as he got on the boat. <clears throat> he went by himself. There's much here that, I lead, that leads to us as to why he was fast asleep even when the storm was raging. I think the fact that he was by himself right now from the time he got on the boat where they had to, I mean, when this is all this is going on, I'm sure they would have got to him earlier. It's almost as if they, oh yeah, look at this guy who came on the boat. He paid the fare right before we left. I think it shows a measure of conviction that's setting in, especially when we understand how conviction works. <clears throat> He's in, he feels in no way like he wants to go and talk with others. He's not about to be social right now. He knows what he's doing. He's a prophet of God. <clears throat> he was not comfortable, of course, on this pagan boat. He knew he was running from God, so he gets on this boat and he finds a place to himself, hiding down below, and there he falls fast asleep. Listen, conviction will cause you to draw away, to pull away. You will have a hard time enjoying life when that conviction is strong in your life. Now, this is important, and understand this. As soon as that boat pulled away from Joppa, the sin was finished. The disobedience was complete. All right? Any point he could have turned around, said, I can't do this. But he actually paid the fare, and he got on that boat. The sin was complete. You say, why is that important? Let me explain. Your conscience always awakes the most after the sin is complete, not during it. When it, It's almost as if before that you sort of block it. You know it's there. You know the disobedience is in place. But while you're there, your focus is on that rebellion. Your focus is on that sin. But when the sin is complete, oh, your conscience wakes up. And that conviction kicks in. And I assure you, has Jonah looked back and saw that coast disappearing of Israel? Which is where Tel Aviv is today. It was where he was leaving, actually. His conscience awakened. Jonah, what are you doing? The conviction would set in. And he had to get by himself. He had to get alone. The conviction always hits the hardest 
the moment the sin is complete. Again, before that, that rebellious determination seems to block the power of it. But then once it's complete, you want scriptural proof for that? Look at Judas. Look at Judas. He had reasoned with himself why this is right, why he could justify this sin. But once that sin was complete, his conscience awakened. The conviction set in. He couldn't even handle it. It was so strong what he just did. I believe that's what's taking place in the life of Jonah. I believe as that coast disappeared, his conscience awakened. The sin was complete. He really did get on a boat to run from God. It was no longer a thought, a plan. He put it into place. It's happened. And now God sends a storm. <clears throat> Again, so why is he asleep? I believe the fact that he is alone and asleep speaks to the level of conviction on his heart. You see, asleep? Yep. I think I can show it from Scripture. This is a deep sleep, it says. He is fast asleep. There's a storm raging. He's not waking up. I think this has a great deal to deal with how weary his soul is at the moment with conviction of the level of disobedience that he is doing. He's in this deep sleep. He wanted to escape the pain of his decision. And grief, listen, I've learned this in counseling and other ways, grief actually can produce sleep. Look in Luke. I'll show you right in the Bible. Look, look in Luke chapter 22. This came to mind. Look at Luke 22. I don't think this is a restful sleep by any means that he has. I believe it's a result of the grief of his actions. Look at Luke 22. <clears throat> Let me find it here. Verse 45. This is Christ. He'd been praying in the garden for the cup to pass. And remember the disciples, they fell asleep. Look at this in verse 45. And when he arose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping. Why? For sorrow. For grief. It wore them out. The grief that they were experiencing over what was taking place literally wore them out. It was exhaustion. They were done. These were men who wanted to stay awake and just simply could not. Of course, Jonah's grief is for a different reason. What is going on in his soul? I believe that's what produced it. And you see that. You see that at times with the wariness of, of, of souls who are in, whether it's conviction or a level of turmoil that it's going through. And you can see the pulling away and, and really how many times sleep really does just simply take over. It's happening to Jonah. It's happening to Jonah. The shipmaster now comes and finds him. And he gets reproved by a shipmaster. This is a prophet of God getting reproved by a pagan man telling him, you need to pray. Incredible. Sad. I believe Jonah tried to pray. I mean, he realized as soon as he woke up, we're in trouble. And you better believe that conviction, the very moment he woke up, and he sensed the storm. No, it was back immediately, the conviction. Immediately. I believe he tried to pray. But he knew, I'm wasting my time. God is not going to hear me right now. <clears throat> he knew, I wonder if the thought crossed him. A week ago, I could have prayed. I can't now. You know what that's going to produce? More conviction. <clears throat> so the the wording here is in, I don't know if there's anything here. Go back to the book of Jonah. There's wording here, though, that I found in there. So I couldn't find anybody, any commentary that I went through. I tried to find several that would say anything about this. Well, actually, I think one did. I take that back. But still, it wasn't, wasn't clear. The wording here is interesting. But yeah, there was one who, who did write about that, I should say. I think it was Barnes. <clears throat> Notice the shipmaster changes 
what he says about God, how he addresses God. And so I don't know if that indicates something that he recognized with Jonah and he changes, but he says this, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. Some already told the other, the other mariners. But then he changes it. If so be that God will think upon us, that we perish not. It was no longer thy God is my point. It was almost as if he addressing Jonah's God as the God. And of course, Jonah's going to let him know that is the God he serves. We're going to get into that next week. I don't know if there's anything there, but nonetheless, I find that interesting that it is worded like that. And so, whether Jonah tried to throw a prayer there, didn't change anything. So the mariners decide we have to do something. They still believe this is supernatural, and they are convinced that there's some type of evil on board. There's something wrong on board. And so they decide to cast lots. They decide they're going to cast lots. By the way, as we know, they're right on target. They're exactly right. The storm is supernatural. It is sent for judgment on somebody that is aboard that ship. The casting of lots, of course, was used for several reasons. Um, and one, one primary reason was actually to determine the will of God, to seek God's intervention. Of course, it was used when Matthias is chosen. Uh, we see it in Proverbs 16, 33. I can't quote that now. Let me turn there. I, was, uh, I meant to actually write it right in my notes. Uh, let, let me turn there and read that. <clears throat> The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. <clears throat> That's why I had Levi get this billum. It was this billum here. I was about, uh, about two months away from leaving. And I had my last men's meeting, like some of the men of faith like I do here. And so it was my last men's meeting with all the men from the two works, and I had them at my house. So they're all at my house, getting the houses up on stilts, if you remember, so they're all underneath the house. And we had pretty much finished. I preached, and, and we ate, and, and, and fellowshiped, and, it, and it, everything was pretty much done. I was, we're getting ready to make arrangements for everybody to get back. And then the men surrounded me, and Puce, who is one of the main men, had this bag in his hand. He had, had my bill in his, in his hand. And they were dead serious. There's no more laughing. They're serious. They surround me. And they got this big circle around, and, and he walks into it, and he says, he says that they had two lots in here. One says Alaska, and one says New Guinea. And he says, we want to see if this is the will of God. And he said, reach in and pull one out. Oh, my goodness. I was like, oh. and I know I have to do this. And so I'm praying, Lord, please let me pull out Alaska right now, because they're going to kidnap me right now. If, they, if I pull out PNG, I'm not going anywhere. And so they held it out, and I stuck my hand in, and the whole disposing was of the Lord. When I pulled it out, it said Alaska. They began to weep and cry, and they hugged on me. And they said, it's of the Lord. And I said, yes, it is. So they do this with Jonah. They cast the lots, and we don't know the exact means. There's different ways that they would do this, actually. We don't know the exact way that they chose to do this, but the lot fell upon Jonah. He was the cause. He was the reason that this supernatural storm that's getting ready to split this ship right in half. He is the reason why they're all in danger. The Lord honored the fact of how they went to a, a, a casting of lots. The lot falls upon Jonah. And again, there's a great lesson here. I mentioned it last week. Be sure your sin will find you out. And so we're going to pick up next week with their discussion with Jonah, what takes place all the way up to Jonah being thrown overboard of this ship. With